All right, so I think we'll get started. So welcome everyone to this week's Science by Diverse Scientist. Today, scientists, today it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Alejandra Castro. So Professor Castro was born in Chile. She received her bachelor's at the Universidad Católica de Chile. She then came up to the US and got her PhD at the University of Michigan before heading further north up to Canada where she did a postdoc at McGill and then finally did a postdoc at Harvard before attending a, or before earning a faculty position at the University of Am Amsterdam, where she now comes to us from. So um, with that, uh, welcome Professor Castro. Um, she'll be telling us today about her work on black holes, quantum gravity, and holography. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And thank you so much for the invitation. Um, really excited. I'm very happy to be here and tell you about my, my work and, and share with you uh, what do I do for a living. Um, and so yeah, so I'll be talking about black holes, quantum gravity and holography. Uh, I'm really going to do my best to not go over time. And um, at the end, please ask me tons of questions, anything that you want. And also, you can also ask me questions that are not necessarily about what I'm going to talk about. Uh, if you just want to know more about what does it mean to be a physicist or anything, getting your degrees and stuff like, please feel free to bug me. Um, and also bug me about black holes, quantum gravity and holography, if you wish, but okay. Very good, so let's get started because um, there's a lot of words here and they're pretty big. Uh, but one of the words, the central um, topic of this talk is black holes. I'm obsessed about black, about black holes. I'm completely, absolutely fascinated uh, about black holes. Uh, and there's many reasons for it. Uh, black holes are like really, besides being a good source of science fiction and movies and stuff like that, um, they have just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful properties. And they're super interesting as, as objects in physics. Um, there's mathematical reasons why they're very interesting. Uh, I'll try to highlight uh, some of those. Um, today, but there's also like nowadays we live in an era where black holes are making a huge impact in observation and in theoretical physics uh, and foundations. Uh, they tend to be like in the type of work that I, that I do and, and a little bit of what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, they're really good as, as building new bridges. Uh, you start by studying the physics of black holes, you start recognizing new connections in, in physics uh, that are very surprising. And I'll tell you very briefly, I'll mention to you some of these connections. Uh, but what's going to be key and, and what I'm going to tell you about today is that they hold the key to quantum gravity, okay? They have, they have all the secrets. Uh, they absolutely have all of the secrets. But okay, but before we go uh, into uh, the realm of black holes, I did want, I wanted to give you a little bit of a perspective of all the corners uh, of physics that we're going to explore today, uh, because there's going to be a lot of uh, different moving pieces and, and we're, we're going to be everywhere. Um, so let me, I want to kind of uh, give you this, this uh, little bit of perspective of, of what are we going, what are the type of questions that we're asking? So um, in, in a way, when we study physics, we, we're studying phenomena uh, that basically are characterized by three parameters. They're characterized by how heavy an object is, by its mass. Mass is a very fundamental thing to measure, to quantify in physics. Uh, size as well, distances, lengths are things that we use, and speed, okay? And depending on uh, which range, like if things are very heavy or, or very small, like we kind of explore different things. So for instance, there's there's aspects in physics where we look at objects that move very slowly or move very fast. Um, we might be interested in, in objects um, that are very big or very small. And in terms of mass, we might be looking at uh, objects that are very light or very heavy. And this for us uh, basically defines different types of theories, uh, or if you wish, different subjects that you've taken uh, in your physics uh, degree. So for instance, um, if I start putting names of uh, um, basically courses that you take it, they basically explore different parameters in this cube. So here, for instance, uh, 
stands uh, classical mechanics. So let me, sorry, let me put it here so it makes a bit more sense. So for instance, classical mechanics is a realm where we study physical phenomena for objects that move very slowly, they're pretty big uh, and they're rather light, okay? Now quantum mechanics on the other side is a subject in physics uh, where we're also concerned about um, objects that are moving very slowly as well. Uh, but in contrast, they're not big objects. In quantum mechanics, we're interested in very, very tiny objects at the level of atoms and things like that. So here, for instance, classical mechanics, when I say big, it's like big, like me, <laughs> like human size. Uh, but in quantum mechanics, we're interested in objects very uh, small. Now, if I move in the axis of speed, uh, for instance, um, we're interested in theories for which uh, you're moving, for instance, relative to classical mechanics, you'll be moving very, very fast. And in this corner over here, so for instance, if I stand here, I'll be looking at things, it's where you look at things that are very small and moving very fast. And this is what we denote as basically uh, quantum field theory. So it's a combination. So this side of this cube, for instance, is a combination where you combine special relativity and quantum mechanics. Now, if you explore now this side of this axis, if you go and decide to look at, at things that are very heavy, uh, not light, as in classical mechanics, uh, you will encounter yourself in this corner here of general relativity. So this is, for instance, where uh, parts of the black hole physics and, and where we're going to start our discussion is up here. So we're looking at things that can move very fast. So if you're very up here in this part of, of the diagram and you're also considering objects that are very big, very, very, very massive. And when I talk about quantum gravity, what I have in mind uh, is that it basically it will be a theory, it will be description of physics that basically uh, include things that are moving very fast, that are very heavy, and that could be as well very small, okay? So that's roughly speaking in a very sort of uh, nutshell. So I put it up here. So basically in quantum gravity, I have in, in, in terms of this aspect, things that are fast, small, and very heavy. And just to contrast it relative to classical mechanics where things are slow, they're, they tend to be big, and they tend to be light, okay? So this is what I mean by uh, quantum mechanic, and this is where other subjects in physics that you might have in encounter basically fall uh, within uh, this description, okay? Now, uh, with this in mind, what I'm going to do today uh, is that we're going to explore uh, three different doors, okay? So there's going to be basically three subjects that we're going to go through as the title, uh, depicted, we're going to talk about black holes, we're going to talk about uh, quantum gravity, and we're going to talk about holography and make connections among those three uh, different subjects. And the way that I, I organized uh, this presentation is such that each of these doors is going to reflect, uh, basically it's going to contain uh, different pieces that will allow us to make uh, connections. So when I discuss black holes, what I'll have in mind, I want to show you basically uh, what are universal properties of black holes. Black holes are really like, they're, they look a little bit scary, but they're really magnificent. Uh, they, they have beautiful properties, uh, beautiful dynamics. And this illustrates basically to us uh, universal uh, features about how uh, general relativity behaves and what I want to do here is basically gather these universal properties that will lead me to the area of quantum gravity. And in this area, I want to illustrate what are the challenges and what are the clues that we get based on this knowledge of black holes, basically how can we start building and understanding a theory of quantum gravity. And that will take us uh, to the last subject, which is the subject of holography, which is basically a solution to this problem of quantum gravity. And I want to tell you how do we think about quantum gravity? What is the framework that we have? And how do we understand? How do we design theories of quantum gravity? What does it mean to have a theory of quantum gravity uh, nowadays? Okay. Uh, so these will be the three doors uh, that we're going to explore. And so with that, uh, let's open 
the first door, okay? So let's talk about black holes. So what, what are these things? Okay, so the first thing I have to say, if I want to talk about black holes, I have to tell you a little bit about general relativity. Okay, so what is this, uh, this theory uh, that I, I mentioned at the beginning? So general relativity is a way, uh, it's a framework in which we understand the gravitational force. Okay, so we understand gravity in terms of basically geometry, as, a, as these pictures are depicting. So the way objects move, basically, is dictated by the shape of space and time. Okay, so space time dictates basically how an object, how matter moves. So for instance, if you have the sun, and this is planet Earth, the shape that the sun basically makes on its surroundings dictates how the earth moves around the sun. And it affects everything. It affects not just planets, but it affects any object that has some energy associated to it. So it will affect us, but it also, for instance, affects light, the bending of light. And it also, you can also have in this context, uh, ripples. So you can have gravitational ripples. But the punchline here, what I want you to to know about uh, general relativity and about uh, how we understand the gravitational force in the context of general relativity is that gravity is, a, is basically, in contrast to other forces, gravity is geometry, okay? So we think of the gravitational, the reason why I'm stuck to this uh, chair, like our feet are on the ground, it's because of the geometrical properties of this gravitational force. And this is beautifully uh, depicted uh, in this equation, uh, which is basically uh, the Einstein's uh, equations that describes these motions. So these equations here that tells us on one side, uh, so this is the equation, the side of the equation that contains information about the geometry. And this is the side of the equation that tells you about what is the matter that is influencing uh, the geometry. This is basically the set of equations that tells us basically the, out the potential outcomes uh, that you have, okay? And so in this context, as you study the, these equations, and for instance, uh, for in, this, in this example here, if you think of this up here as being the sun, the sun is curving. You can see here from the picture that it's curving um, the space time uh, surrounding it. And in this context, a black hole is basically a situation where the, the curvature of the space time, so how much you're deforming the space uh, comes to an extreme, okay? So it's a, a black hole is basically a region in space time where you have a lot of, of this like sort of, like it becomes very, very, very uh, narrow, uh, this shape uh, of, of the geometry, okay? And it's so deep that not even light can escape. So it's kind of like the, the usual analogy is like if you're in a canoe on a river and, um, um, and, and let's say that you're in this canoe in this river and so it's taking you down a stream and so this stream is like gravity but imagine that uh, suddenly uh, you have something yet yeah, you, you'll get to Niagara Falls or something like that <laughs> you, you'll have a big fall uh, if you if you if you cross basically uh, some region of space you won't be able to escape so your little canoe basically is coming down here down the stream uh, and at any point here, you could basically go back, but then there will be some point if you're here, you can't basically go up and escape uh, this, this throat. So that's basically in a very sort of uh, brief way what a black hole is, okay? It's a, it's a point where curvature is so extreme that you can't escape it. It doesn't, you can't climb a, out of it, okay? And not even light, the reason why it's black is because not even light can escape. Very good. So that's the basic uh, understanding of black holes. Now, I will write um, if I'm not assuming that any of you have in particular done general relativity or not, but I do always find satisfaction in writing <laughs> one equation. Uh, and so basically, uh, the most th this is the most famous uh, black hole that we have. And so what we do in, in the area of general relativity um, is that this, this object here is the metric, what we call the metric. So basically it contains the information about the shape uh, of the space time. 
And, and this is the, what we know, like the most famous black hole solution, which is called the Schwarzschild um, space time. And the way that we visualize uh, this black hole, so we tend to not draw pictures like this. Um, so these are fun to draw, but it's not the, the, the mathematical or the formal way that, that we draw a black hole. We tend to draw uh, pictures of this form, this, these pictures that I'm, I'm depicting here, which are called uh, Penrose diagrams. So if you ever encounter this, uh, this diagram, uh, this is basically uh, a relativist uh, notion of what a black hole is. And so to tell you what this picture uh, basically contains, uh, it's basically telling you about um, your causal properties. So in special relativity uh, and in general relativity as well, uh, you keep track of how light uh, moves in a given uh, space time. And so any point here in this diagram, so if you're a little individual standing, let's say there, can maybe I'll draw it so that the little person doesn't go away. So let's say that you're standing there at some point in space. Um, you can basically at any point here, you can draw what do you have access to? So what is your future and what will be your past? What we call our, our causal uh, cone. And what this picture basically depicts is that uh, what we call the event horizon, so this line here is basically the line for which if you're here, you can have access, you can move in any direction inside of this cone. Uh, and, and this will basically depict your future. This part of the region will depict your past. Uh, but as you move here, and let's say that you decide to move it towards this direction, at every point here, you will have a new um, a causal, causal cone. Uh, but what happens here at this point is that after you cross this point, you can't, your cone here, for instance, this one that I drew here, uh, all you, that you have access to in your future is basically moving upwards and you can't basically access what you have uh, out here in the future, okay? Uh, so this basically tells you that you're trapped. So it's basically uh, the picture that in terms of this drawing that I was putting down here, uh, when you're inside of this region is basically when you're inside of that part over there. So that's the interior that, of the black hole that tells you that you can't escape. And what I'm calling here this event horizon, roughly speaking, if you want in a cartoonish way, is will be like that size that you have uh, over there, okay? But in any case, don't, don't worry too much about this. I know I'm being uh, somewhat uh, eh, technical, but this is the way that we, uh, in the theory of general relativity, uh, how we understand uh, black holes, okay? And what's important for you to remember, for instance, in this solution, which is uh, one of the simplest solutions that we have in hand, there's a parameter here in the solution, what, which we call the mass, and then this mass basically dictates to you how big uh, this size over here is, okay? Now, something, um, so something like this already, uh, leads to a lot of uh, good movies. Uh, for instance, some of you maybe have seen uh, Interstellar. It, so it leads to a lot of fun science fiction. It also leads to a lot of uh, paradoxes as well, uh, which today I'm not uh, going to discuss, but they, they do come uh, with, a, a <laughs> black holes come with a lot of uh, troubles. Uh, but what's exciting about black holes uh, in, in in this century, uh, well, and also since they, they were uh, discovered, is that these are not objects that we have to imagine. So it's not an object that you have to like fantasize about, like, oh, what is this black hole? No, Ob black holes are th objects that nowadays we can hear and we can see. And so even in the past uh, 20 years or so, there's been beautiful astrophysical experiments uh, that have detected black holes uh, either indirectly or uh, directly with the most recent one uh, being this event horizon uh, telescope that is measuring uh, the shadow uh, of the black hole. Uh, so they're quite uh, real, okay? So we don't have to just imagine them in movies uh, and come up with thought experiments, uh, they're there. And so then it becomes 
uh, even more urgent to try to understand uh, what are the secrets that they, they hold. And so I'm a theorist. And so I think about black holes in, in a very theoretical uh, uh, perspective. And the things that uh, I want to highlight to you uh, are, are basically what are, what are properties of this black holes and properties that are dictated uh, by how big they are, okay? By, by this uh, horizon that, that tells me uh, when I won't be able to uh, escape, okay? The size, this is what we call the size of the black hole. And from this point of view, there's various properties that are, are quite simple. So let's take uh, a cartoon of a black hole. So I'll be drawing a black hole like this black blob here. Uh, they don't have texture. So this is just my uh, brush from my iPad, but you should think of a black hole. I just didn't want it to be boring and draw like a black circle, but um, that okay. Uh, that's, how, that's my conception of a black hole. And the way I want you to think of a black hole is that it's basically an object uh, that has some mass. Uh, a black hole can also rotate so it can be spinning, so it can have angular momentum. It doesn't have to just be like sitting there, so it can, it can spin. And it can also carry, for instance, electric charge. It could carry other um, uh, quantities. It doesn't have to just carry mass and angular momentum. It can also be electro electrically charged or, uh, or even magnetically charged if you want. Okay, so let's think about a black hole just like that. Okay, like if, if you want a little bit like a big, like a big planet, not quite, but okay. It's just basically a very massive object. That's how I want you to think about it. And as a good physicist, um, what we're going to do with this black hole is that uh, in physics, we love to kick things. <laughs> we love to throw things at each other. That's what we do in physics. And so let's do that. Let's throw something into a black hole. Uh, don't throw yourself because you won't be able to escape, but okay. Throw your friend, I don't know. Uh, anyhow, throw something into the black hole. What will happen if you throw something into the black hole? Well, um, it will grow a bit, okay? So we'll draw a bigger circle, okay? And then you will throw something more into it. So let's say now you throw a star uh, into it. And so what will happen? Well, then the black hole will get even bigger, okay? So you keep on throwing uh, objects into this massive uh, object and the black hole will start growing and growing in size. It loves to eat. Um, and, but the thing that is interesting about this process is that as you throw objects into the black hole and it gets bigger and bigger, uh, is that there's a simple uh, equation that tells you how it's growing, okay? So, how, so the black hole has a mass characterized by it and a size, which is basically this red circle that I'm depicting here. And as you throw more mass into it, it's increasing and its, its size is increasing. And there's an equation that relates how the mass of the black hole changes uh, according to, and how, sorry, how the increase in mass basically increase, affects the area of the black hole. So basically this perimeter uh, here. And the, the quantity that enters, uh, there's a proportionality con uh, a constant that enters into this uh, relationship, uh, which is basically called uh, the surface gravity. So this is, this is uh, the acceleration that you will feel as you cross uh, the horizon, okay? It tells you a little bit about the force uh, that you feel as you get close to the black hole. But the important thing here that I want to highlight is that basically uh, the change in mass induces a change of the shape of the size of the black hole, and it's basically dictated by this beautiful equation. So you go from M to M plus delta M and the area of the horizon will change according to this equation. Very good. So why is this uh, an interesting equation? It's, it's interesting because back uh, in the seventies, uh, people noticed that this equation looked like some an, a different equation in physics um, that was, somewhat similar. And so the analogy that they noticed, like what I was describing to you right now is what we call black hole mechanics. So what happens as you temper the black hole, how does the black hole respond? 
they noticed that this equation here that I wrote resembles very much this other equation that you might have seen in your thermodynamics class. And so if I identified the mass of the black hole with energy, and I identified the area of the horizon with entropy and the surface gravity with temperature, this equation basically looks like the first law of thermodynamics. And in particular here, uh, there's some constants that go in. So it's not, the area is not exactly equal to the entropy. There's a factor of four and I'm putting back here uh, some, some units, but basically the entropy of the black hole is given by this equation. So it's proportional to the area of the black hole. And this kappa is basically playing the role of the temperature is what we call the Hawking uh, temperature. So there's this beautiful, uh, at this stage as how I have introduced you right now, uh, it's, it's an analogy where you see that the equations that dictate the response of the black hole are basically the same equations that dictates the response of a thermodynamic system. So what happens to a thermodynamic system if you increase the energy, how would the entropy of the system be affected, okay? And so this is what I call a very universal, every black hole that you have. So uh, no matter how you came up with a black hole, uh, and if you, it doesn't matter how you modify or change a bit Einstein's equations, what matter do you put in, or how many number of dimensions you have, uh, all the black holes that we know, uh, no matter the details of the black holes, all of them obey this. And this is what is the universal kind of robust uh, feature about black holes. And um, what this is going to give us is uh, it's going to give us our first clue about quantum gravity. So let's move to the second door and understand what this teaches us about quantum gravity. So, we had this beautiful equation, okay? So this was the Bekenstein-Hawking uh, entropy uh, for the black hole. And uh, here it's controlled by basically, uh, as I restore units, it's basically controlled by uh, three constants, the speed of light, G Newton and H bar. So if we go back to this um, uh, cube that we looked at at the beginning, uh, basically, the speed of light is the coupling constant that controls this axis. So uh, how fast you travel relative to the speed of light is basically what I call fast and, and, and slow. H bar is basically what tells you if you're big or small. So it's basically what tells you if you're in a classical theory or in a quantum theory. And G Newton is basically what tells you how heavy you are. Okay, so if you're uh, a very light, or a very heavy uh, type object. And the thing that is cool about this formula is that the black hole cares about all of this. Okay, so the, this entropy of the black hole uh, is something that is sensitive to the size, to the speed and the mass. And so from this point of view, it's our first hint that there should be, the, uh, there should be something that we call a theory of quantum gravity. So it incorporates all the fundamental um, eh, eh, constants in physics, which is quite remarkable. So this, this equation uh, it basically tells you that the black holes are super smart. They're so wise, they know about everything. They know absolutely about everything. But they also tell you, uh, so, so at a more basic level, uh, it's telling you that, so we were talking about gravity, we were talking about general relativity. Uh, but all of a sudden, by studying um, basically the physics of black holes, we realize that this equations, this theory of general relativity contained uh, thermodynamics. Uh, so this is what I mean by gravity knows about thermodynamics. So you were able to derive uh, the first law of thermodynamics by basically studying physics of black holes, which is quite surprising. So in some sense, it's telling you that this black hole type object behaves like a cup of tea. <laughs> so it's basically like something that is hot. It's something that has some temperature, uh, this hawking temperature and, um, and, and, and it's steaming. <laughs> so this black hole is not uh, that, bla that black. But then that takes you if, you, if you make 
um, this assertion here that gravity knows about thermodynamics, then the second assertion that you're going to make is like, but wait, uh, I know that the next class that I take after thermodynamics is statistical mechanics. Uh, so it means basically that this, this entropy should be coming from some statistical system. And this is what the theory of quantum gravity should know about. So in, in some sense, if I think of the black hole as the cup of tea, what makes this cup of tea basically steam should be some uh, microstates, some quantum states. So this basically, this thing is composed by molecules. That's what I'm depicting here. And all of this entropy, all of this heat that this cup of tea is generating is coming because you have basically a number, um, uh, uh, a degeneracy, a, a number of possible configurations. Uh, basically, how do you place these molecules in different uh, energy angular states? And one of the big questions of quantum gravity is like, what is this statistical system? So what is the black hole made out of? Okay, so this is one of the first things uh, that this, uh, the, it's one of the predictions that black holes are making about quantum gravity. If you know what quantum gravity is, then you should be able to understand how this formula came about from a picture like this. Okay. Now, the other thing that is very surprising uh, about this formula is um, that the entropy here, so the entropy of the black hole, is controlled by the area of the black hole. So this is a bit surprising because in the analogy with the cup of tea, or let me draw it as a box, again, as a cubed, uh, usually when you're doing statistical mechanics uh, and you compute the entropy of, of a system, it's basically counting the number of configurations that you have inside of this box and the number of configurations that you have, uh, the in normal systems, they grow like the volume. Uh, not like the area of the system, okay? So if you have a box of size L, they go like L cubed. And this basically is telling me that this is going like L squared, okay? So this is growing like the area, but in general, um, in, in, in more traditional systems as the cup of T, you would have thought that this went like the volume of the system, okay? And this is what we mean uh, by uh, the other uh, beautiful, uh, clue that black holes are giving us is that uh, as we try to understand what quantum gravity is, it should be something that uh, behaves like a hologram. So it behaves like something that has one dimension less. So instead of going like the volume, it should go like the area. Okay. And so this is what it's going to uh, lead me now uh, to the subject of holography. So by just studying the physics um, of black holes, we have basically now made two statements. The first statement that we made, um, I wrote them here in the other order, but basically uh, by studying physics of black holes, there should be some notion in which we understand uh, the degrees of freedom, the, basically the molecules that make out this big black hole system. So we should know about um, what, are, what is the statistical mechanics version uh, of the black hole? Uh, so this, this is one of the puzzles. And then the second one is that gravity uh, is um, holographic, okay? Now, uh, what I want to do next then is tell you about this uh, holographic uh, proposal. So this is the third door uh, that we're going to open. So what is this big word of holography? So the way that uh, based, it was very much inspired by the physics of, of black holes, the way that uh, people then started noticing that the way that we should understand its gravity is as follows. It's basically depicted uh, by this uh, cartoon. So imagine that you have your gravitational theory, this, this beautiful theory where you see the ripples of space time uh, living here in this red uh, region. The proposal of gravity is that everything that you wanted to know about the theory living here in this volume, absolutely everything that you wanted to know here can be encapsulated by a projection on the boundary, okay? And there's a theory, there's a different theory living at this boundary, okay? 
which we call like basically a quantum, it will be a quantum theory, it will be a theory that does not have gravity on it. Uh, but everything here in the blue region basically determines the interior. Okay, so if you know the boundary, then you can reconstruct everything uh, inwards. And that's what we mean by gravity being holographic. So you have a theory living in a volume and everything in this volume is just basically encoded on a surface, okay? And so this is, this is the proposal that gravity should be basically a system that in order to describe it and describe it in a full and quantum way, you should need one dimension fewer, okay? Very good. So the, 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 the more sort of formal way that we talk about this uh, is basically saying that if you have a gravitational theory in what we call d plus one dimensions, this should be equivalent to a quantum field theory living in d dimensions, in one dimensions less. And uh, ways that we draw this, the ways that we try to depict this are basically this, like we might draw it like this, this is similar to how I was drawing it in the previous slide. So here gravity is in the volume and the quantum theory is at the edge, or you can think of it as a can of soup. This is a very good analogy. Um, so basically in the, in, the, in the can of soup analogy, uh, you can think of gravity as being the soup. And so it's living in, inside of the can. Uh, but if you read the label, then you know what's inside of the can. So you know if it's tomato soup or chicken soup and you know all the ingredients and stuff. So the theory that it's the quantum theory is basically, it's the label that is at the, at the edge here. Okay, and the theory of gravity is the, is the soup that is in the middle. And in this context, the jargon that we use, if you ever run into someone working in this field, uh, they will be talking um, about the bulk theory and the boundary theory, and they basically mean bulk, uh, means the gravitational theory and boundary theory means the quantum theory that doesn't have gravity at the edge. Okay. Now there's a very famous example of this, um, and it's because it's the one that actually formalized. So uh, you you can upgrade this proposal beyond uh, the physics of black holes. So in the context uh, of, for instance, uh, string theory, uh, this was actually made uh, more rigorous. Okay, so there was very serious like evidence proposed on how do you actually uh, realize that this is a re reasonable thing to conjecture and, and there's piling and piling evidence that this is uh, the way that we should understand gravity. And, and in this very famous incarnation of this holographic uh, proposal, uh, the gravitational theory that is living in here is basically a gravitational theory that has a negative cosmological constant. That's what these letters uh, Stanford uh, ADS basically means that you have a theory with negative cosmological constant. And this quantum theory that lives here at the boundary, it's a special type of quantum theory. It's a theory that is basically uh, what we call a conformal field theory, which it just means that it's a, it's a quantum system that uh, it's invariant under uh, uh, dilations, okay? But uh, what I want to emphasize about this, so we're not going to, uh, well, uh, there, this will come a bit more as I keep on talking, but time flies. <laughs> but what I want to emphasize to you uh, is that we know various things, how, how if you put here this conformal field theory on this side, on the edge, and you put your theory of ADS here in the middle, uh, we know how various quantities are related uh, between the two sides uh, of this duality. And from this point of view, this, this correspondence, this relationship between uh, these two seemingly very, very different subjects. So on one side, you have a theory that has a cosmological constant. On the other side, you have a theory that is invariant under dilations. It's like, what are you mixing apples with oranges? Um, actually, they're, they're related. And this has led to really beautiful uh, practical uses of the correspondence uh, because it relates to things that are seemingly different, but then that allows for a lot of discovery and potential. So for instance, uh, people have used this correspondence to understand aspects of the quark uh, gluon plasma. So these are experiments that for instance, uh, occur at RIC um, or at the ALICE experiment uh, in LHC. 
Uh, it also has led to interesting properties of high TC superconductors. Uh, people use it to understand better what is the relativistic theory of hydrodynamics. Uh, it also allows you to understand uh, other type of strongly coupled uh, systems. So there's systems that are very complicated in physics, ADS-CFT allows you to get a, a, a I hope in that. And more recently, there's been a lot of uh, interplay between quantum information and, and basically this theory on ADS, which is uh, quite a lot of fun. So this is what I meant by like building all sorts of new bridges. By connecting two things that were seemingly very different, uh, you start uh, understanding how things that in a quantum system might have seemed like, okay, familiar, then you can give them a new interpretation and understand how they tell you something about a theory of gravity and vice versa, how gravitational uh, features give you new predictions about what might happen uh, in quantum systems. So this is fantastic. Uh, and so from my point of view, like what I, a lot of the things that I do is that it, the, what, what this gives me as a tool, uh, it basically tells me, uh, that there's a very non-trivial relationship between two very similarly, very, very different uh, subjects in theoretical physics. But also uh, it, it gives me a framework to understand what might mean to do quantum gravity. Uh, because quantum mechanics and quantum field theory is something that we're seemingly really good at doing. Um, and so if you understand a lot about what's happening here at the edge, you might be able to understand everything that happens here in the middle. Uh, and so from that point of view, this is what gives me like this framework. So it tells me like, look, if you work really hard here at the boundary, you'll be able to understand what happens uh, in the bulk, okay? So you have to read very, very carefully the label so you know what's inside, what, what soup you're about to drink. Okay, very good. So, um, we have basically um, explored uh, all of these three doors very quickly. It's been 45 uh, minutes. Um, and I wanted to give you a little bit more of a hint, uh, more precisely of what I did, oh, sorry, what I do. Um, I think I do want to have time for questions. So I'll see. What can I say in five minutes? <laughs> and then uh, if I run out of time, it's fine. You can, we can talk about it a bit more, but I wanted to give you a bit of like the perspective of like, this is a very big subject. There's many different corners that one can explore. And I wanted to tell you what, what is it that I do in this context. So because I'm in the Netherlands uh, and I love Escher, um, I like putting pictures uh, of his drawings here. Um, so, so this is my perspective on, on a bit what's happened. Okay, so what, what have I been telling you? So uh, this, this drawing here, you should view it as um, basically an, an increase in, in complexity and, and how difficult uh, something uh, might start looking at. So we started today's uh, talk a bit down here. Okay, in general relativity, in a theory where geometry uh, meets gravity. And uh, the goal of it is to get up here to this theory of quantum gravity, and in particular, uh, what we call uh, string theory. So string theory is this candidate theory. Uh, it's our best understanding of what quantum gravity uh, might be. Uh, it's very complicated. There's a lot of moving pieces up here. And going from this direction to this direction, uh, if you just say those two words, it feels uh, very, I get overwhelmed. <laughs> and so we have to take, uh, we need to understand what this road is, what does it mean? Uh, how do we get here? So how do we get from these beautiful pictures uh, of planets and waves uh, up to this picture of quantum gravity that we uh, suspect is described uh, by strings? And so, the, the steps that we're taking uh, in getting there uh, are basically the first step that we took is this one, okay? So we took the step of studying, studying black holes. So this takes us up into exploring what quantum gravity is. And in this perspective, um, in, in, in this area of black holes, the thing that I've, I told you about was that the first clue that we knew that there was an end to this path was this Bekenstein, um, 
Hawking entropy, that black holes contain uh, thermodynamic properties. And this tells you that they're basically composed of something. There's like molecules that form the black hole and we want to understand what, what is the information uh, basically inside uh, of this black hole. Now, um, our view, how are we trying to understand uh, this equation, this equation that tells us that things scale with the area and not the volume are basically encoded in this holographic principle in our modern view of how we should basically interpret uh, this type of, uh, of relationships. Oops, sorry, did I miss? <laughs> ah, <laughs> sorry, I had an extra slide. <laughs> so, um, so basically uh, this, these two subjects here are connected, uh, telling us that uh, the way that we should understand this theory as we try to get to this theory of quantum gravity uh, is that we should understand it in a way where the objects that are entering are the areas, are these things at the boundary uh, and not the volumes. So this is our, our holographic uh, point of view. Now, a lot of the work that I do, I have one minute left, uh, goes into a, an interplay between this holographic principle and, and the theory of black holes in a context of lower dimensional models. Um, so although I work on, on, on string theory and that's, that's what I do, uh, I'm, uh, string theory is a theory that lives in 10 uh, or 11 dimensions. Um, a lot of my work is actually in lower dimensional models uh, because they give me a lot of precision and control on how to make progress on basically uh, these two uh, subjects. Okay, so trying to understand the mechanisms of, of basically this holographic principle and how they impact the physics of black holes and then basically get up to our holy grail. Uh, but it's a kind of fun, like uh, don't, one shouldn't shy away from these lower dimensional models because they do, uh, in some sense, they're simpler, um, but they also have come up with a lot of surprises. So a lot of the beautiful properties that you find in this lower dimensional models have impacted uh, even our understanding of general relativity and how, for instance, uh, nowadays, the physics of gravitational waves is very much impacted by the roles of uh, symmetries and gravitational scattering. So, so uh, all of these connections, um, and so, so this one, of course, is intertwined with the directions here, as I'll show in a moment. Uh, but these lower dimensional models as well impact uh, our understanding of gravity, uh, even in the context of uh, general relativity. Now, uh, but basically, these are these are the ingredients, and a lot of the uh, uh, technical things that I do and uh, mathematical. Uh, concepts that enter, uh, for instance, I, I summarize it here. So I use elements, uh, this first one is basically making reference that I use elements of number theory, uh, supersymmetry enters a lot in my investigations, conformal field theories, and, and this transcendence theory, which is basically an example of these low dimensional uh, models. But I think now I'm one minute over. So I think I'm going to skip if you have questions, I can tell you a little bit more about what I'm doing, but I think I'm going to jump to the end. There, I jumped, we jumped. And so I hope um, I was not rambling too much. I tend to ramble, so <laughs> you'll apologize if I was rambling. Uh, but I hope I gave you a little glance into each of these directions and tried to motivate uh, you, based on the physics of black holes, like basically what is this and what is that? Um, and I hope you got a glimpse of what black holes are. And uh, what I wanna say is basically there's, um, there's many, 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 many different directions that you can explore. I mentioned some through the talk, uh, but there's also other types of black hole physics that I even haven't uh, explore and I'm happy to tell you about tons of other aspects of black hole physics uh, that you could uh, discuss other topics, other doors that you can open. Uh, but this is to basically illustrate to you that um, black holes are full of surprises. Uh, they really, really contain a lot of fantastic physics. Uh, it's not just theoretical physics or mathematical physics. Uh, there's also great opportunities for discoveries and, and uh, and observations. So, and what I'm excited about is that they really hold this uh, 
key to quantum gravity. Uh, so with that, I'm going to end here and I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you so much, Professor Castro for the amazing talk. Um, so as always, if anyone in the audience has questions, it would be great if you could pop them into the Q&A um, and then we can answer them if they come in. So we actually already have, and I don't know Alejandra if you can see the Q&A, but we already have one question from Fatima that was actually asked mid-talk uh -huh. about black hole evaporation. So Fatima asks, are black holes capable of evaporating? Yes, they are capable of evaporating. Um, so, yeah, so the, temp the fact that they have a temperature uh, does tell you that they can evaporate. It depends a little bit. Uh, you, you, you can make them be stable, so you can put them, um, you, you, can, you can make them be in equilibrium with a system, but you can also make them sort of radiate, and then they will start getting, if you take this, this effect into account, they will start becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, and, and this process of evaporation is what leads to the, uh, to the black hole information paradox that uh, drives many people in my field mad, terribly mad. Uh, so uh, I didn't want to dive into that because it's a very controversial subject, but yes, they do evaporate. Uh, if you start taking uh, this, this temperature, like if you let the black hole evolve, they will shrink uh, and they will basically emit all of this heat uh, outwards. Yes. Great. So next we have a question from Nicholas Tyler who asks, is it bright inside of black holes? Uh, in a sense, well, it depends on what you define by bright. Um, uh, but it's, it's a little bit hard to answer because we don't know the inside of a black hole. We, the thing that we know uh, is that if you fall into a black hole, you won't be able to escape. So the black hole in some sense is eating up light. Um, so, but it's, uh, it's uh, what, this is one of the challenges of black hole physics. So things that we know about black holes is how do we see them from the outside? So we're, we're uh, because if I go inside then I, I won't be able to tell you what happened. Uh, and it's not like in the movie Interstellar. You will not find your daughter behind like a closet if you've seen the movie. If you haven't seen the movie, don't worry. But that, that part of the movie was fiction. Uh, so I don't know what happens if you fall in. Um, but in some sense, the black hole is eating objects. And so in some, if, maybe if you're inside, you will see the things that are falling in and it, it might look bright from that point of view. Uh, but from the outside, uh, yes, they're radiating, they're evaporating, but they mostly, it's a very small, small temperature, but then they mostly look black from the outside. They're very greedy. They don't like to share things. All right, so next, Wen asks, based on the second law of thermodynamics, does the area of the black hole increase over time or are there other forms of entropy production? Uh, no, the area of the, of the black, the, there's also a second law. So there's even a, a zero flow. Uh, there's a first law and then there's a second law. Uh, the third law, it's a little bit more tricky, um, but um, yeah, there's a second law of thermodynamics. Uh, you can prove it in certain, not, uh, that's, uh, that depends a little bit more on the theory, uh, but it, in just general relativity, in Einstein's theory of general relativity, you can prove that the entropy, it always increases. Uh, but this depends on the specific theory of gravity. If you have matter that is very complex or if you modify the, um, if you have modifications to your gravitational theory, which string theorists love to do, uh, it's, it's not always, uh, it hasn't been formally proven, but we do expect it to always be true. The entropy always increases. So there's a second law. Great, so next Trevor asks, does holography imply that a more complete picture of gravity requires 12 dimensions? That's a great question. Um, Sorry, uh, sorry, so the, the theory, um, it, sorry, so the gravitational theory will be in 11 dimensions, so then the boundary theory is in 10. Uh, so it's one less, not one more. Um, so, yeah. 
but it depends a bit on the on the specific context, but it's it's the other way around. So string theory as a theory of gravity, the maximum number of dimensions that we've been able to formulate it in a consistent way is 11 dimensions. It goes under the name of M theory. And then uh, the boundary theories, uh, the quantum theories that describe them should be in one dimension lower. Great. So next, Lillian asks, how exactly do you use number theory in your work? Ah, uh, number, that's, uh, it's, yeah, it, it comes in the statistical part. So number theory is all about counting. Uh, it's counting, for instance, the most famous counting is counting the number of partitions. Uh, and this is something that shows up a lot when you're building partition functions, like in statistical mechanics. So I use number theory to try to understand what are partition functions of quantum systems. Uh, and so that, that's where number theory enters. So you're in, 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 in statistical mechanics, it's very common that you encounter uh, these uh, type of modular forms. So Ramanujan's um, a formula for counting number of partitions is something that occurs a lot, for instance, in the Ising model uh, and spin systems, uh, all of these type of systems. Their partition functions are controlled by objects that also appear in number theory. Uh, and it's just because you're trying to divide particles into like different positions. And then it's very similar to the problems that people encounter in counting different possibilities in number theory. Great. So when asks in your research, do you deal with analytical models more or computer simulations? Uh, I'm super analytical. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it depends this, this well, I, I personally, uh, I'm paper and pen. Um, type person. I do use Mathematica, but that's not really a computer simulation. That's just because sometimes um, there's algebra or there's things about the Einstein's equations that are easier to do in a computer uh, instead of doing them by hand. Um, but it's it's mostly just the, um, it's like, oh, if you want to diagonalize a three by three matrix, it's kind of, you can do it by hand, but it's tedious. <laughs> so it's that type of like, uh, oh, it's easier if you do it in Mathematica or MATLAB or Maple, whatever like um, software you have. So that's the type of like, that's the way that I use my computer. But no, I don't do simulations. Uh, there are people in my field that do do simulations. Uh, so it depends on which corner of this uh, holographic correspondence you want to study. But I personally don't. Great. So one asks another question. Uh, going by the analogy of holography, is there maybe a laser light source that you need to reconstruct the 3D image? That would be fun. Uh, I think uh, people have been like, yeah, in, in some sense, that's what we're trying to do, but it's a very theoretical laser. Um, uh, but people have been trying to like think of tabletop experiments that will be able to illustrate how the theory is working in a holographic way. Um, it's, yeah, gravity is very tricky from that point of view because it's very weak as a force. Uh, but yes, in some sense, uh, in theory, uh, yes, it will be like, I'm trying to build this laser that will reconstruct uh, things. Yes. Great. Um, and then Baruz asks, what is the source of the ring of lights that in um, photos black holes are surrounded by? So you're asking probably about this picture of the Event Horizon Telescope, I suppose. Um, so yeah. So what ha what's happening in this picture? So yeah, so we don't see the black hole. So this is the shadow of the black hole because the black hole is black. Um, so the black hole is like somewhere in there. Um, and so what's happening is that the black holes, um, so very similar to, to this, let me just, maybe show the other picture um, that I had back here. So imagine that this was the black hole. And so uh, you have matter around the black hole and in particular you have light. And light, so light bends, and it also, light can also orbit the black hole. It can go around basically in circles. Uh, and that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the last stable orbit of photons around a black hole. And so basically what this picture is illustrating uh, is basically the radiation. Ah, where's my picture? There was my picture. This is basically uh, photons kind of going around the black hole and then emitting outwards. 
And this like size here is basically the smallest orbit that a photon can have before it, it unavoidably has to like fall into the black hole. So it's what's called the, the, the photon ring. It's, this, uh, it's three times the Schwarzschild radius. Um, no, sorry, three times M, three times the mass of the black hole. And it's basically the last stable orbit, like Kepler-like orbit that a photon can have around the black hole. So it's the last thing that you can see uh, that it's orbiting the black hole before it has to fall in uh, and it becomes unstable. So if you're inside here as a photon, you might still not be inside of the black hole, but you can't be like stably just going around it. So you will have to, the photon eventually will have to, um, if it has a velocity kind of pointing it towards the black hole, it will go into it. Uh, that's what will happen. So that's, that's what you're seeing here. And then it's more bright uh, on the bottom than on the top. And that's just because of the, uh, the redshift. So it's how the object is moving like towards or against you, that's all. Uh, but that, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing matter, basically we're seeing light traveling uh, around the black hole. All right, <laughs> so I think that was our last question we had and we're already a couple minutes over. So I think we'll stop there. So on behalf of everyone who would clap if we were in person, thank you again, Professor Castro for the excellent talk and thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, hope to meet you sometime soon. <laughs> yes, thank you all. <laughs>